glorious greeting, God's children. This is a day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to the final day of the Master's Touch E Crusade 2016. Whoever's doing that scraping, please turn your mic off. I'm Dr. Stephanie, your host, and uh, I just want to welcome you again to our last day of the E Crusade 2016. This whole week through, to through today, Friday, November 18th, we've been bringing you anointed preachers and teachers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We've been delving deeply into grace, wisdom, and mercy, how they connect and impact our being in Christ, and just what that means to us. You know, our journey has taken us through grace, wisdom, mercy, blending them together, giving us a beautiful picture of God Almighty and our Savior and Lord Jesus the Christ. And we've been seeing that grace uh, is, is a whole lot more than what we thought. Why wisdom is the principal thing and how mercy drives everything that God does, because it's His love. Our goal has been to bring enlightenment to your understanding of God's Word so that you will, you'll end up with a complete understanding of who you are in Christ and what that actually means to you. Now, bringing the anointed messages to you have been preachers and teachers of the gospel of Jesus the Christ, and they will be joining us again today from around the globe. Some of them aren't able to make it, but the rest of them will. <laughs> our journey's already begun, my friends, so let's get started as we begin our final day of the illumination of God's Word. Once again, we pray that you have come expecting to receive. And I ask you, did you? Did you come expecting to receive? If not, today's the day. You, if you don't expect to receive from God, my friends, you won't. So get that expectation level, level elevated, because I want you to know that when you come expecting to receive, you will come away each day with a better understanding of God's Word and a better head and heart connection. So expect to receive and you will. Now, for a second, take a, a time to assemble a small piece of bread or cracker, a small bite of food, and a swallow of some sort of beverage or juice. You know what can even be water. Assemble those elements and set them aside, because later on we're going to pray over them, sanctifying them as the body and the blood of Christ. But let's begin by inviting the Holy Spirit to join us in our final day of E Crusade 2016. Let's pray. Father, we come into your presence with praise and thanksgiving in our hearts. It's flowing freely from our lips. Lord, we praise you and adore you, and we don't only love you because of you first loved us, but we also love you for who you are. We have tasted of you and your goodness, and we want more and more and more. We're not going to be satisfied with a snippet, a just a little taste, a little bite here and there. We want a whole meal. So we thank you for blessing the Z Crusade 2016 that you've instructed us to bring to your children. We give you thanks and praise for blessing and anointing in super abundance, the speakers, the participants, as well as our listening and watching audience. Lord, we are so privileged to have had the opportunity to be obedient to you and your word and to be even a very small part in the move that you're making in the spirit and natural realms. Bless those that have ears to hear what you and your word teach us as we endeavor on this final day of our e-crusade. E e almost said escapade, but it is, it is. It's an escapade. It's an e-crusade to reach and impact all who are able to come listen in person and those who tune into the messages in our archives. We bless you for blessing us, and we thank you that we are privileged to know you more intimately and love you more deeply as we grow in grace and come uh, to a more developed understanding of you and your word. Thank you for the gift of utterance. Thank you for the bless uh, the blessing on each speaker with, um, with which you uh, uh, put your word and and that gift of utterance too. Uh, thank you for the gifts of a rhema word of God and revelation knowledge that you grace each one of the participants and listeners with. Thank you, Lord, that your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. In the name above all names, the mighty, awesome, powerful, and magnificent name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. You know, as we move deeper into the Word of God on our journey today, we're going to see that we're learning more about being in Christ. And we know that soaking in worship opens the door to the manifest presence of God. So as we soak in worship this morning, let God hear you speak to His heart. And as we prepare for His Word, open your minds and hearts expecting to receive Him.
You know, without a doubt, the blood of Jesus is the most precious gift <clears throat> that our Heavenly Father has given to His church. And yet so few Christians understand its value and virtue. Christians often sing about the power of the blood. Indeed, the anthem of the Pentecostal church is, there is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. But most believers seldom enter into that power. Trust me, they don't enter the power of the blood. We simply do not comprehend the great significance of the blood. For example, we constantly plead the blood as some kind of mystical formula to protect us. But uh, few Christians can explain its great glory and benefits. Now, if I were to ask you what the power of the blood means, you might answer, it means that my sins are remitted, that I'm free from the bondage of iniquity, that all my sins are covered. Yet beyond forgiveness, what does the blood of Jesus Christ mean to you? I mean, can you explain to me, to your family, to a co-worker of the value and virtue of the blood of Jesus? I want to give you a fuller understanding of the preciousness of Jesus' blood and just how very valuable it is and how wonderfully it can work changes in your life. In scripture, the blood is spoken of in two ways, blood shed and blood sprinkled. Now, most Christians know about the blood Jesus shed for us. When Christ lifted the cup at the last Passover, he said, this cup is the New Testament or New Covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Luke 22, verse 20. You know, we memorialize his sacrifice every time we have communion. But that is the limit of most Christians, the knowledge of the Jesus' blood and what it did. We know only about the blood being shed and not about its being sprinkled. The first biblical reference to the sprinkling of blood is in Exodus 12, verse 22. You see, the Israelites were commanded to take a, a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood of the slain lamb, and sprinkle it onto the lintel, the upper post over the door, and down the two side posts of their front door. That night, when the death angel came and saw the blood on the doorposts, he would pass over the house without harm. Now, please understand, as long as the blood was left in the basin, it was of no effect. It was merely blood that had been shed. The blood had power to save only when it was lifted out of the basin and sprinkled. You know, why, why couldn't the Israelites have simply laid the basin of blood at the threshold and said, well, it doesn't matter what we do with it. After all, blood is blood. Suppose they put the basin on a linen-covered table or on a pedestal just inside the door. Well, I'll tell you what would have happened. The death angel would have struck that home. The blood had to be lifted out of the basin and sprinkled onto the door to fulfill its purpose of protection. Now, this blood in Exodus 12 is a type of blood of Christ. <clears throat> the blood that flowed at Calvary was not was not wasted. Oh, no. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> it didn't fa fall to the ground and disappear. No. That precious blood was collected in a heavenly fountain. There is a gospel song that says, There is fountain filled with blood, then sinners plunged beneath that flow loose, beneath that flow, lose all their guilt and stain. I don't have it in the rhyme form uh, set up that way. Anyway, but this is this concept isn't scriptural. Uh, you know, it isn't. We don't plunge into the blood or swim in it. No, it's sprinkled on us. Now, if Christ is Lord of your life, then your doorposts, your heart, have been sprinkled by his blood. And this sprinkling is not for forgiveness only, but also for protection. You see, when you're sprinkled, you are totally under the protection of Christ's blood against all the destroying powers of Satan. And when his forces see Christ's blood on your doorpost, they have to pass over you. They cannot touch you because they cannot touch anyone sprinkled with Christ's blood. So, you see, the preciousness of the blood has to do with much more than just forgiveness. Jesus' blood has not been left in the basin, but has been lifted out and sprinkled on your heart. And it is waiting to be sprinkled on the doorposts of the hearts around the world. So there's also a sprinkling of blood mentioned in Exodus 24, verses 1 through 11. In this passage, God made a covenant agreement with Israel, and he promised, If you will obey my words, I will be a God to you, and you will be my people. Now, after Moses read the lot of the people, they answered, We understand and we will obey. They agreed to the covenant with the Lord. Now, this covenant had to be sealed because you can't have a covenant if it's not ratified. It had to be ratified and made valid, and that could happen only through the sprinkling of the blood upon it. Hebrews tells us Moses took the blood and sprinkled both the book and all the people. Hebrews 9, verse 19. See, the shed blood of the burnt offerings was contained in a basin, and Moses took some of this blood and poured part of it in the altar, or part, part of it by the altar, I should say, and then he took a hyssop, dipped it in the basin, and sprinkled some of the blood on the 12 pillars, representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Finally, Moses dipped the hyssop into the basin and sprinkled the blood on the people. 
This blood covering the people sealed the covenant. So it's clear from the passage that the sprinkling of the blood gave the Israelites full access to God with joy. On this occasion, it had nothing to do with forgiveness and remission of sin, but rather with communion. They were now sanctified, cleansed, fit to be in God's presence. Then Moses, Nahab, Abihu, and 70 elders went up to the mountain to meet God. And, oh, I meant not Nahab, Nadab, I'm sorry, Nadab, Abihu and the 70 other elders went up to the mountain to meet with God, and the Lord appeared to them coming down uh, a sapphire stone walk. Now these men saw, oh, think about a sapphire stone walk, you guys. Wow. These men saw a table spread before them, and scripture infers that with ease, comfort, and no fear of judgment, they sat in God's presence and ate and drank with him. And up, uh, upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand. Also, they saw God and did eat and drink. Exodus 24, 11. This is simply amazing. I mean, think about that. These men could eat and drink in the very presence of God, whereas shortly before they had feared for their lives. It was because the blood had, had been sprinkled and they understood the safety, the power, and the security in that. They weren't afraid. They didn't have any fear. Listen, beloved, today we are in a new covenant with Jesus Christ, a covenant sealed by his own blood. And likewise, today, we, uh, uh, when we have that precious blood sprinkled on our soul, it is for purposes of communion. It is so that you can go boldly with ease, without fear of judgment, into God's presence for communion. You are given access to Him with no sin condemning you. You're free to talk to God and enjoy His company. Now, one of the most important sprinklings of blood was done by the high priest. Once each year, he went into the Holy of Holies to make atonement, which means reconciliation. Now, this act was meant to wipe away the people's sins so that they could be reconciled and have communion again with the Heavenly Father for the following and upcoming year. The priest would carry into the Holy of Holies a handful of incense, a censer of burning coals of fire from the altar, and a container of blood from the slain ox. Now, Within the Holy of Holies was an ark, on top of which sat a flat golden top with a lip around it, and this was the mercy seat where God sat. <coughs> it was his very presence. The mercy seat had two golden cherubim on either side with the wings spread over the seat. So actually they looked like the wings were not going back like we think of an angel with wings flapping behind him like a butterfly, but they like arms going out forward, covering the a total top of that Ark of the Covenant, except for a space between them, which was considered the mercy seat. That's where God sat. Now, after cleansing himself in an elaborate ceremony, the priest went inside with the Holy of Holy. He went inside the Holy of Holies with great reverence and fear, because why? Well, he has to be pure, you know, and he dropped the incense into the fire, causing an aroma and smoke to ascend. And this represented the prayers of Christ interceding for his people. Jesus ever sits at the right hand of the Father interceding for the saints, my friends. Then the priest dipped his finger into the blood and sprinkled it seven times on the mercy seat, just flicking it, you know, sprinkling it. And he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his fingers upon the mercy seat eastward, and before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. Leviticus 16, verse 14. When the blood was sprinkled on God's seat, forgiveness of all sins was accomplished and all past sins were covered. Now when the high priest came out, the people knew God had accepted the sacrifice and their sins were pardoned. Israel never doubted it. There was no doubt in their minds. Now I know that you're probably sitting there going, yeah, I don't know. But they didn't because that's what they were taught. That's what they believed. Now, beloved, we too have a high priest. His name is Jesus. He's our Lord, and he is our high priest, not just once a year, but for all time, every day, every second, every moment that, that we're alive, every breath we take. And he's our high priest, like I said, for all the time, to the end of the world. Now, Jesus took his own blood to the true mercy seat, into, the, into God's presence in the Holy of Holies, up in heaven, and presented it for the remission of all sins, of all believers, of all, of, of all time. Those that had been, are now, and were to come. So, um, he went into that true mercy seat in the Holy of Holies, and then he presented it for the remission of all sins, for all believers, as I said. And it was a final, locked-in place sprinkling. Scripture says of this act, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Hebrews 9, verse 12. How much more shall the blood of Christ purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Verse 14. Now, it, it, now to appear in the presence of God for us, Hebrews 9, 24. 
Jesus took his own blood into heaven for us, and it isn't reserved there simply as a memorial. It's not like in a big box that everybody looks at and says, oh, when they walk by it, like we memorialize things here on this earth. It's to be sprinkled on all who come to him by faith. It's still there. So how is the blood of Jesus sprinkled upon the heart? Well, you know, it's tragic that so many believers don't enjoy the power and the virtue of the blood of Jesus. Scripture makes it clear it's important for us to know how the blood has been sprinkled on our hearts. This is done in two ways. The blood is sprinkled on us by the Spirit of Christ who dwells in us. Jesus sprinkles his own blood on us when, by faith, we receive his finished work at Calvary. This isn't a physical sprinkling. Rather, it's a legal spiritual transaction. He sprinkles the blood on our hearts in response to our faith, and until we truly believe in the power of his sacrifice at Calvary, the blood of Jesus cannot produce any effect upon our souls. Whom God has set forth to be the propitiation, a reconciliation through faith in his blood, Romans 3.25. Churches around the world partake of communion regularly, and yet Paul warns us not to drink the cup unworthily. This doesn't mean merely partaking of a communion service after we failed in some way, uh, and, and we know that if we repent of our sin, Jesus will forgive us and cleanse us of all iniquity. No, 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 no. Paul is saying that we are to discern Christ's body properly. All right? That is what it means. Um, he's talking about coming to the Lord's table, drinking of the cup symbolic of his blood, and yet not believing in the power of that blood. It has to do with sitting in condemnation and fear, not believing that Christ's blood was justified and sanctified us in God's sight. See, so many believers are condemned out of the wonderful experience of the Lord's table because they don't come to the blood in faith. Paul is saying, no wonder so many are sickly among you. You are left weak because you do not believe in the total victory of Christ's blood. Now, these kinds of Christians are saying, in essence, I know it's wonderful to be justified through the blood of Jesus Christ, but I still have trouble believing the Lord reckons me righteous. After all, I still haven't arrived. I still struggle. Listen, beloved, the truest evidence of faith is rest. If you believe with all your heart, it brings your conscience and soul into rest. And when you come to the Lord's Supper and partake of the cup, you can say, hey, I believe I'm saved, forgiven, healed, because I believe in the blood. I trust in it. Now, the blood of Jesus is sprinkled on our soul through Holy Ghost preaching. So when you hear Christ and his blood being exalted in, the Hol and in Holy Ghost preaching or Holy Spirit preaching, you can know the blood is being sprinkled. See, when Philip preached the gospel to the eunuch, that man's heart was ravished by the word. Immediately he begged to be baptized. Now, Philip said to him, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Act, Acts 8, verse 37. Likewise, every time you take to heart the Holy Ghost anointed preaching, crying, Lord, please give me all your truth. You are being sprinkled with Christ's blood by faith. At this point, you may be wondering, well, how can I know whether the blood has been applied to my heart? Well, here are three ways you can know if you've been sprinkled by the blood. Number one, if you are now willing to walk in the light and allow the Holy Ghost to expose all darkness in you, you can know you've been sprinkled. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleans, cleanses us from all sin. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. So John's clearly talking about someone who is in love with the word, unafraid of reproof, who says, Lord, shine your Holy Ghost light into every crevice of my heart. I want to walk in the light. And if you love the light, it's a sure sign you've been sprinkled. Number two, if you call on the power and authority of Christ's blood when you're under enemy attack, you can know you've been sprinkled. When those uh, who have not been sprinkled are in trouble, what do they do? They call their best friend or a counselor, a mentor, or they wallow in fear and condemnation. But those sprinkled with the blood immediately stand on Jesus' blood. We plead the blood. Now, we often hear of that phrase, pleading the blood. Yeah, and it's used in Christian circles. But that's not a scriptural term. It's something somebody said. And the word plead here means argument. It suggests begging, beseeching. And that is a defensive mode. You, we can't really use that word right uh, correctly. Um, if I know that when I use that word and I, I plead the blood, I don't plead the blood in that begging thing. Yeah, I mean, I, my mental attitude is different than what that represents. So our attitude has to be stronger than that. We are warriors. Don't forget, you're strong. You're blood bought. You're blood saved. More than conquerors through Jesus Christ. Overcomers. We are not in a courtroom with the devil pleading a case. We don't have to. Christ does that for us. We are the victors. We already won. Jesus has won the victory for us. His blood has prevailed and the gates of hell can't come against it. 
You know, they won't stand against it. And I believe our battle cry should be, I proclaim the victory of the blood of Jesus. I am blood washed, blood bought, blood justified, blood saved, blood ransomed. And I proclaim the victory of the blood of Jesus over myself, over my whoever I'm praying for or whatever. Now, when you're so secure in the cleansing, justifying power of the blood that your conscience no longer condemns you, you can know you've been sprinkled. Your conscience does an evil work when it doesn't wake, uh, wake you or stir you to obedience to the gospel. It does evil when it's unnecessarily, it unnecessarily condemns you, accuses you, constantly reminds you of how you failed. God causes uh, us to, uh, with, and when we're blood-bought, causes us to be overcomers of that. And uh, the enemy, on the other hand, is the one who's pointing out to your failures, uh, and uh, it causes us depression and fear. But... When you fully rest in the cleansing, justifying power of the blood of Jesus, when you take command of your conscience in the spirit, your conscience is no longer an accuser, but rather does its work properly. So when the devil rises up with an evil accusation, your conscience proclaims the victory of the blood. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. That's what that means. Hebrews 10 verse 22. A peaceful purged conscience is a sign of being sprinkled with his blood. So what are the benefits that flow from the blood? Uh, uh, and we're talking about the blood of Jesus here. And once your heart has been sprinkled, what are these benefits that come from Jesus' blood? Now, Jesus' blood redeems us from sin and the power of darkness, in whom we have redemption through his blood, Ephesians 1, 7. We are no longer under condemnation or fear. A lot of people have been redeemed and justified by the blood, but they don't know it because they live in fear and condemnation. They've given faith to the Lord, but they haven't entered into the glory of being justified by the blood. They're like a man who has built up a huge debt and can't pay it. The man's wealthy boss comes along, pays the bill without telling his employee, and then calls him in to give him the good news. The man sits down, is handed the dossier of debt, and flips through the pages to see the list of bills he has accumulated. He thinks, oh man, I'm never going to be able to pay this. They're going to throw me in jail. And when the CEO sees the man's fearful countenance, he says, uh, in a perplexed you know, fashion, excuse me, did you look at page one? And the man flips back to the first page, which reads, paid in full. Now, many Christians are just like that man. They don't know their sin has been covered, paid in full. We have to enter into that knowledge by faith in order to have the benefit, which is peace with God. So Jesus' blood has purchased the whole church of God. Feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Acts 20, verse 28. Christ's church is not for sale. Forget the idea of Satan bringing down his church. Don't wring your hands and moan, oh no, the church is going to hell. No, it's not. It's not going, it's not going to hell. It's going to heaven. Why? Because it's been blood bought for eternity. Jesus' blood breaks down walls, all walls. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one and broken down the, the middle wall of partition between us. Ephesians 2, 13 and 14. You know, <clears throat> there's a church in Times Square. It's called the Times Square Church. And this seems to have had a, a great meaning with them. More than 70 nationalities worship there. But that church doesn't have any walls. No nationalities, in other words. You know, look, we're the body of Christ. We are all one in Christ, a blood-sprinkled church. Not just a building. We aren't a building. Indeed, those who are blood-sprinkled no longer have any walls, folks. There's nothing between us. There is no distance between us and God. They've all come down. Jesus' blood sanctifies us. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. 1 John 1, verse 7. This ought to put a big faith smile on your face. You are sanctified, sprinkled clean. This is a continuing work of the Spirit. It's that continual waterfall of the blood of Jesus that covers you so that nowhere is any dirt or filth or anything evil going to come near you and touch you and cling on you. You're blood-bought and blood-washed continually. Christ's blood overcomes Satan and puts him to flight. And they overcame him, the devil, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Revelation 12, verse 11. What is the word of the testimony? It's simply this. I believe in the blood. I testify to the prevailing overcoming power of the blood of Jesus, and I proclaim its total victory. If you want to overcome the devil, stand on the blood and proclaim its power. The blood gives us access to the Holy of Holies, to our Heavenly Father without reproach. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest of the blood by the blood of Jesus. <clears throat> Hebrews 10 verse 19. I'm going to read it again. 
Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Okay, and once again, that's Hebrews 10, verse 19, if you're taking notes. We are all to come into our Father boldly, without fear. So what does God expect of us once we're sprinkled with the blood of Jesus? Well, we are obligated, or are we, I should say, obligated in any way by this sprinkling? You betcha. Yes, we are, very much so. If we have been sprinkled by the blood of Jesus, we are commanded to do two things. One, we are to go in peace and doubt no more. Didn't know that, did you? <laughs> we are to go in peace and doubt no more. When Moses sprinkled blood of, of the, uh, 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 it wasn't God's blood, but I mean, or Jesus' blood, but when he did a sacrifice and he sprinkled the blood on the sinning Israelites, they never once doubted they were pardoned and accepted by God. They trusted in that sprinkling. Today, the blood sprinkled on us is not that of bulls, goats, or sheep, but of Christ, the Lamb of God. And yet, uh, we have more doubt, more fear than those Israelites. Martin Luther said, it's blasphemy to take back to ourselves all the sins that were laid on Christ. And I agree. It is absolute sacrilege to go about in fear, guilt, condemnation, to say that the Bible says that by faith I'm cleansed, justified, and protected from Satan's power, and yet I can't believe such a glorious thing is possible. Number two, we are to praise God with the thankful heart, never doubting. Gee whiz, doubt again. Okay, we're commanded to thank God for the precious blood of Jesus with high praises. We also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Romans 5.11 Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. Psalm 32, verse 11 Blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. Verse 89, uh, Psalm 89, verse 15 I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. Isaiah 61, verse 10 Listen, get out there and proclaim the victory of Jesus' blood in your life and begin praising him now for the promises that of that great day of the redemption ahead. I hope you, I hope you received this. But now I have to do this. <laughs> I, I, wasn't, I didn't prepare, folks. I'm sorry. Here we go.
It's my distinct pleasure to introduce to you my colleague and dear friend, the pastor of Refuge of Hope, Pastor Karen Weitzman. Now, Karen began Refuge of Hope Healing Room, School, and Crisis Counseling Center as a way to reach out to those who were extremely depressed, oppressed, and discouraged, especially reaching out to those who were con contemplating suicide. Then she continually reaches out to the chronically ill. Her most recent focus has been on those with diabetes, Crohn's, and multiple chemical sensitivities, uh, bringing them intensive in-house healings to relieve pain and discomfort, enabling their healing to manifest. Karen's driving force is that Christ came so that we could have perfect health. Therefore, she wants everyone with chronic disease to benefit from his healing word. Karen's healing room began operation in Miami, Florida, moved from Florida to Vilas, North Carolina, and from there she's added her current offices to Fort Collins, Colorado, where Karen brings the healing word of God to, to, to those seeking healing and miracles through the power of God. You'll find Karen's online presence on Facebook under Karen Weitzman, as well as Refuge of Hope Ministries. And she's also found on the masterstouch.org, our website, under Crisis Counseling and Refuge of Hope Ministries. She's got a lot of wonderful things there for you, and they're all complimentary to de delve into, and you can reach her through that website. Karen makes herself available as well on Skype, uvu.com, and by telephone for consultation, healing services, prayer, and guidance counseling. She'll also bring the ministry to you through the setting of local appointments. You can contact Karen. She's given me permission to give you her phone number at 305 area 467-7232. That's 305-467-7232. And oh yes, one more thing. Karen is a talented spiritual blogger and also available for ministry sessions and speaking engagements. Contact her by email at honoringhands at aol.com. Again, that's honoringhands at aol.com. I give you right now, Pastor Karen Weitzman. Good morning. Good, good morning, family. I hope you're enjoying the crusade as much as I am. I'm really, um, so many messages that uh, are on the gamut of the whole word of God and, and things that you'll be able to take with you and know who you are in Christ. So let's start out with praying. Um, let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, um, I'm going to rejoice today for, Lord, you are my source. You're my Alpha, Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. As we bring forth your words of wisdom today, let us rejoice that we are no longer bound by things of this world, but we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to bring the things of heaven to earth daily. Father, give us the zeal and passion to herald in Jesus each and every day, as he stands at the door and invites us to come in and sup with him. Father, we give you all praise and glory today, and Father, we thank you for the rhema word of this crusade, and that people will go forward knowing who they are in Christ and what plans you may have for them. And we give you all praise and glory for this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now the title of my uh, excerpt today is Entering Heaven Here on Earth. Uh, we go to Matthew uh, chapter 6, verse 10, and uh, this is a chapter that gives us the first indication that we are to do the will of the kingdom of God here on earth in the Lord's Prayer. Now the Lord's Prayer says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven's. And then in Romans 14, verse 16, we discover that the kingdom of God is not only eating and drinking, which are earthly vices, but the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And in fact, when the Holy Spirit has come upon us, we shall be witnesses to Jesus in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You see, entering heaven here on earth no longer uh, binds us by the things of this world. We have been raised with Christ, and we should set our hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. Family, we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to bring the things of heaven to earth right now. However, most of us believe that the ultimate goal for us here on earth is to make it into heaven when we die one day in the future. But the Bible says that if you do not enter into the kingdom of heaven here on earth now, we may not be entering heaven after we die either. Now is the time of God's favor because the 
kingdom of heaven exists now here on earth, and it is where God lives and where his power is seen and exercised. It is not just in a faraway place called heaven for some distant time in the future, but it is here on earth now. Hallelujah. The problem lies is that we're li where the problem lies is that we are living in our ways and not God's ways, and we are not dying to the flesh of our sin daily, which is called sarks. However, we have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer us, we who live, but Christ who lives in us. Galatians 2, 20. Now, if it, were, if it were up to us in our abilities, we would wait until we die and go to heaven to be perfected. We would live only for ourselves here on earth and for our selfish needs, waiting for eternity in heaven to attain holiness. But the person who does this, you see, even though they may proclaim to be born again, has not entered into the kingdom of heaven here on earth. They are only standing at the door, and Jesus is knocking, inviting them to come in now. Revelation 3.20, I am standing at the door knocking, and if anyone hears my voice, I will come in and eat with him, and he will eat with me. You see, God's plan is that when we receive that born-again spirit of Christ, Christ in us, the hope of glory, then God starts to perfect us and train us to be like Christ. He doesn't start once we have died and go to heaven. No, God starts with us here on this earth now. It is not a one-time thing of accepting Jesus as your Savior, saying the sinner's prayer, and then you're done. No, God takes us through a process of breaking down the flesh so that the spiritual born-again man can grow into the likeness of Jesus Christ. The more of you that lives in your old fleshly man and the world, the less of Christ can live in you. Remember from the word, it says it's only when you lose your life can Jesus live in you. John 12, 24 through 25 says, Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And also, whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. See, it's the crucifixion of your old life, your old sinful body, that Jesus says we must die to. We are supposed to die daily in our flesh. Now, this is how we are entering heaven here on earth. Though our outward man is decaying by, daily, by dying daily in our flesh, yet our inward man is renewed day by day. 2 Corinthians 4.16 God's plan is to use that death of our old self in order to bring forth Jesus in us and transform us into the same spiritual image of his Son who dwells in heaven and in us. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, We all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Family, this is the true gospel of Christ. By our being obedient to the word of God, he's transforming us into the same spiritual image of Jesus Christ. By doing this, not only have we entered into the doorway of the kingdom of heaven, but we are now learning to walk in his kingdom. <clears throat> God's plan is for us to be transformed into the very image of his son, Jesus, right here on earth now. He is working in us with trials and tribulations in order to perfect us into the likeness of him. Philippians 1 verse 6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in us will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. Yes, the Lord is perfecting us and he wants us to be like Christ here on earth and not just in heaven. Luke 6, 40 says, The disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is perfected, shall be as his teacher. So entering into the kingdom of heaven here on earth is not just being perfected and transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And it's not just about holiness. It is also doing the works that Jesus did. John 14, 2 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the kingdom, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Now this is the kingdom of heaven being exercised here on earth. 
Matthew 6.10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Likewise, the kingdom of God also exists in God's power. Uh, Mark 9, verse 1, and he said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God present with power. <clears throat> and, his, and his disciples did see the kingdom of God, not up in heaven, but on earth with power, with signs and wonders. You see, the kingdom of heaven operates with the power of healing, and Jesus walked in it. Now he turns right around and he gives us the power to walk in his shoes. Matthew 10, verse 1, verse 7, and verse 8. And he called to him his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction, and then to proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. And verse 11 then says, Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near you. When believers call the things that are not as though they were, Romans 4, 17, this is part of the supernatural kingdom where God dwells, where God speaks, and his word manifests itself in the physical. The kingdom of God is within you, God dwells within each and every one of us with the evidence of the Holy Spirit sitting on the throne of our heart. It's with our spiritual eyes opened in our heart that we can see this kingdom. Now, how do we utilize the supernatural power? Well, Matthew 11:12 tells us that the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. So we're taking the kingdom of heaven by force because the devil is fighting born-again believers tooth and nail so that we don't enter in. We are using our prayers, our words, and our faith, which God has given us to create reality. Mark 11, 24 says, Therefore I say unto you, all things whatsoever ye pray and ask for, believe that ye have received them, and ye shall have them. This is an unmistakable promise from Jesus that calls things that don't exist into reality according to your belief. Your believing is the only condition to this promise. The conflict arises when the devil comes against you with all he has to make you doubt God's word. What you see, what you hear, what you feel will all come against what you pray for and what you're trying to believe for. That is why you must take the kingdom by force. You are battling your flesh which wars against the word of God. 1 Timothy 6-12 through says, Fight the good fight of faith to lay hold of eternal life. You see, faith is a constant battle, and we are encouraged to fight, not in the physical with our flesh, but in the spiritual. Although we do walk in the flesh, we are not to fight according to the flesh. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not of the flesh, but they are mighty before God to the casting down of strongholds, casting down vain imaginations and every high thing, that is exalted against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into captivity into the obedience of Christ. This is where our battle is. The Word of God says one thing while our mind and our thoughts say another. It is a constant battle that we must fight in order to walk in the kingdom of heaven. And that is why the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. See, you have to pick up your spiritual sword every day, the Word of God, and take captive the, de the devil's lies before they reach your mind. If not, you start to have faith in what you see and hear instead of what God says in his word. An example of this, of this is 1 Peter 2.24, when Peter said, uh, By whose stripes you were healed. Now this is a past tense, past tense promise, that you have already been healed by what Jesus suffered on the cross. Your eyes, what you feel, and what the doctor tells you will directly war against what the Bible clearly says, that you were already healed. Now starts the battle. Do you believe what God says, or do you believe what the devil is telling you and showing you by what you see and feel? In God's kingdom, there is power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. 1 Corinthians 4, 20. 
See, if you have the faith to believe God's word, you know the authority you have in Christ, and you are now casting out demons, healing the sick, and exercising the will of the Father. This is walking in the kingdom of heaven. Now Christ is seated in heavenly places at the right hand of God. And Paul, in Colossians 3, 1, is telling us that we must think about our resurrected position with Christ. He tells us, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Therefore set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated. Our thinking should reflect our resurrection in Christ. If we are going to have a heavenly mindset, we must first start with understanding our position in Christ. Everything that is the Son's is ours also. This seating reflects our unity with Christ and the authority that comes with it. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore use my authority and go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 28, 18 and 19. See, many Christians are fearful to evangelize. They're fearful to share their faith and fearful to counsel, fearful to serve God, so forth and so on. See, we just have to understand our position and our authority, and, that would, and that's going to drastically affect our ministry. When Paul cast out demons in Acts 16, he didn't act on his authority, but he acted on the authority of Christ, whom he was seated in. If you're going to have the right mindset set, we must focus on our resurrected position. We are different from the rest of the world because of our position in the heavenly realms, and we must live like it. Colossians 3.1 tells us, Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above. The word set here is an active word. It can also be translated as seek. The King James Version says, seek those things above. This does not happen by chance. It only happens through rigorous discipline. If you are not actively seeking things above, then you won't be thinking in a heavenly manner. Paul said in Romans 12 to do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And Christ says you cannot have two masters. You will love the one and hate the other. Matthew 6, 24. Christians must understand that they are no longer part of this world and they must actively seek to think the way God has called them to think. They must seek things above. Now, how do we impress Scripture upon our hearts? Well, li listen to what Moses said to Israel. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the, ro the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 through 9. You see, God gives us several ways to put his word in our hearts. First, we are to teach the word of God to our children. If we are going to think on heavenly things, we must be a teacher. Teach the word to our friends. Teach it to small groups, to strangers. When you have to teach something... You can't help but think upon the Word all the time. Second, they were to talk about the Word of God everywhere. Talk about God when you're at home, when you're walking, when you're lying down, and when you're getting up. So this means that we have to view everything from the mindset of God and what God thinks about things. When you watch movies, the news, or, or are asked a simple question, approach it from the viewpoint of what Scripture says. Some may consider you very narrow-minded, but we are called to separate ourselves from the world and to have the type of mind that pleases God. See, the Jews had to develop reminders to help them memorize the word. They had to tie it on their hands, their foreheads, the door frames and gates of their house. They had to set up places and times in their daily life when they would always encounter the word of God. This includes things like daily meditation, small groups, or accountability meetings. Every morning they had to read their Bible. Every Tuesday maybe we encounter the Word of God with a friend, or when we meet a, a brother or sister in Christ, or a relative of ours. In order to set 
to have a mind that is immovable from the things of God, it takes discipline. A mind that is set happens only by rigorous acts of discipline in studying the Word of God and placing it in our hearts. Now having a heavenly mindset is very important for advancing the kingdom, not only in our lives but on this earth as well. It is for this reason that Satan is always attacking the believer's mind with doubts, fears, wor worldly thoughts. Satan wants to keep believers from focusing on what really matters, and that is God and his kingdom. In scripture, those who practice right thinking receive tremendous ble blessings. Isaiah 26, 3 says, uh, you will be kept in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you, Christ. So see, the person whose thoughts are consumed with God and his kingdom will have perfect peace instead of anxiety and worry. When we find ourselves anxious or worried, we can be sure that we have lost a God-centered mindset. Now, what are some of the benefits of God-centered thinking? Well, let's listen to Philippians 4, verses 8 and 9. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, and whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. See, Paul says thinking on right things and practicing them brings the God of peace. The very presence of God in our lives, verse 9. See, many are missing the manifest presence of God in their lives because they have ungodly thinking, which eventually leads to ungodly practice. In fact, Paul says that the way a person thinks is an indicator both of his salvation and his fruitfulness. Listen to what he says in Romans 8, verses 5 through 6. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their mind set on what the nature desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. So you see, the secular person is thinking only about the desires of his carnal nature. The carnal person, may be, he may be spiritual, but he only wants things of the Spirit that satisfy or glorify him. He may say, God, I need this car or I need this promotion at work. And God, it's my sickness. Can you take away the sickness from me? See, a carnal person may believe in God and pray for things, but God is only a means to his desires. James 4, 3 says, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. However, a truly born-again person desires what the Spirit of God desires. He ultimately wants God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, this doesn't mean that we don't pray for our desires. It means we are not consumed with our desires. The desires of the redeemed should be and must become that of the Spirit of God. Paul says that the one who continually thinks on the desires of their sinful nature will bring the fruits of death and destruction. But the one consumed with the things of the Spirit brings the fruit of life and peace. Romans 8, 6. You see, the mind is very important. What does your mind say about you? It will tell you who you are, a believer or an unbeliever, a person led by the sinful nature or a person led by the Spirit. It will also tell you what type of fruits you will produce. A person that thinks on the things of God receives life and peace. Paul in Col Colossians 3, 1 is calling these believers who are tempted like, tempted like all of us to think on carnal things, to set their heart and mind on things above. He says, since then you have been raised with Christ, so set your hearts on things above, because now, family, we are sitting in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Heaven is now here on earth, so let's worship and praise God for this wisdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. That was wonderful.
you know, we know without God uh, sacrificing his only son, without the blood of Christ being shed, we wouldn't have been redeemed. So today I want to discuss with you the voice of the blood. <clears throat> now, from the beginning, blood has been regarded by God as a most precious thing. In Genesis, we read where God spoke to Cain, The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Note these three things from this first mention about blood. Blood has a voice. Blood has a loud voice. It cries. And blood has a loud voice that God heard. Notice next that the intriguing, instructive, and significant words in Hebrews but ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Hebrews 12, 22 through 24. So in Genesis, Abel's blood cried. In Hebrews, the blood of Christ speaks. You know, indeed, there is a voice in the blood. So let's take a, a comparison look, shall we? Abel was a shepherd. Christ is the good shepherd who gave his life for the sheep. Abel died a violent death at the hand of a relative. Christ died a violent death at the hand of his own nation. Abel's blood cried and God heard it, and Christ's blood speaks and God hears it. Abel testified of the righteousness of God. Jesus was the righteousness of God. Now the contrast. Abel died by force. Christ died willingly. Abel died because of his sacrifice. Christ died as the sacrifice. Abel's blood cried for revenge. Christ's blood cries for remission. Abel's blood polluted the ground, and Christ's blood is preserved in heaven. Now, from the shedding of blood in Eden to clothe our first fallen parents, to the great throng in Revelation who sing of the blood of the Lamb, as we just heard on, on our program, the Bible is a book of blood. You see, the beginning and the end, and in everything between, unfolds the imperative of the blood. So when Abel died, a mysterious voice went up beyond the skies and moved the heart of eternal justice. Abel's blood spoke against Cain, but the blood of Christ speaks for us. Christ's blood pleads before the eternal throne, and it speaks better things than that of Abel. Now the blood speaks of sacrifice. The blood of Christ is the center of the gospel. The blood of Christ is the pivot of God's plan of salvation. You see, the blood of Christ is the great heart of gospel revelation. Yet we're not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world. First Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 20. Christ didn't just die, he was slain. Jesus died a vicious and cruel death, my friends. He was the lamb foreordained before the foundation of the world. You know, one of my colleagues said there was a concept, uh, conception of the cross in the mind of God a long, uh, a long time before there was a reception of that cross in the heart of man. And he, that's so true. Christ was born to bleed, my friends. From his birth to Beth in Bethlehem, Christ set his face toward Calvary. That great hour when the tremendous power of the blood was to be released, we see is anticipated continually throughout Scripture, all the way through. It's the, the um, uh, blood thread through the Bible. Now, in Genesis, Abel's blood cried from the ground, but in Hebrews we read the blood of Christ speaketh better things. The Passover in Exodus has its New Testament counterpart in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, where Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. The sin offerings in Leviticus have their New Testament complement in Christ, who, is, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. The red heifer, which Pastor Karen told you about yesterday, offered outside the camp in Numbers, has a New Testament realization in Jesus that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without, outside, the gate. Hebrews 13, verse 12. So the chosen place of the sacrifice in Deuteronomy ha has its New Testament counterpart in the place called Calvary. Luke 23, verse 33. The scarlet thread, that's what I was trying to say, that blood thread, the scarlet thread from the harlot's house in Joshua has a New Testament correspondent in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 11. And such were some of you, but you are washed, by, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. The redemption in Ruth has its New Testament parallel in Christ, through whom we have redemption through his blood, Ephesians 1, verse 7. The numerous offerings in Kings have their New Testament counterpart in Christ, who was once offered to bear the sins of many, Hebrews 9.28.
The intense sufferings of Job are merely a foreshadow of Job's Redeemer who cried on the bloody tree, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's found in Matthew 27, verse 46. What Christ did for us with his blood is phenomenal, folks. The outpoured wrath in Jeremiah as a New Testament compliment in Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 10. The three days that Jonah spent in the belly of the great fish has a New Testament counterpart in the Son of Man, who spent three days, three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Matthew 12, verse 40. You see the smitten shepherd in Zechariah has its New Testament counterpart in the good shepherd who gives his life for the sheep. John 10, verse 11. John the Baptist cried, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. So let me ask you this. Where among men and sons of men could blood be found that was rich enough to pay the tremendous debt of sin, precious enough to satisfy divine justice, strong enough to cancel our appalling debt, pure enough to usher in the re re reign of righteousness? Where? Where? Powerful enough to crush the devil. What voice is that which speaks for me in heaven's highest court for good? And from the curse has made me free. Tis Jesus' precious blood. Christ lived a sinless life. He was spotless. As an example, he was a spotless lamb. The perfect consecration, he preached righteousness. But only his blood could save. And almost all things by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by sacrifice of himself. Hebrews 9, 22 through 23, and verse 26. Listen, Christ's blood speaks of an acceptable sacrifice. The blood speaks of substitution. In Leviticus, chapter 16, we find the unique and very interesting teaching of the scapegoat, which, by the way, is not found anywhere else in the Bible. <clears throat> Aaron, God's high priest, would take two goats, one, of the Lord, one for the Lord as a sin offering and the other for a scapegoat. And Aaron said, I'm sorry, I, my eyes are <laughs> blurry. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions in all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited. Leviticus 16, verse 21. You know, when Aaron put the both of his hands on the head of the scapegoat, he would then transfer man's guilt to the animal by confessing the iniquities, transgressions, and sins of the Israelites. The scapegoat, the sin bearer, was then banished from Israel. Someone had to bear the sins of the people, either the individuals themselves or a substitute. Isaiah, the evangelical prophet, foresaw the substitutionary death of Christ when he wrote this. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. Isaiah 53, 3 through 4. I'm sorry, you guys. I can't help it. This is really something that you should take to heart. It's not something that we just skim over in the Bible. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. If you're not in Christ, get in him. That's all I can tell you. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. 1 Peter 3.18 You see the blood of the sacrifice that was given the life of the offerer might be preserved. The sacrificial system meant death for the sacrifice, but life for the sacrificer. When many think of Christ's blood, well, they think only of death. You see, for them it's an end. But Christ's blood also speaks of his life. 
Jesus' death was the gateway to life, my friends. Christ's death strangled death and put death to death. He was raised by the power of his own blood. And because he lives, we shall live also. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. His was not only a life given for men, but also a life given to men. This wonderful truth of substitution is also pictured in the Passover. Let's see if I can get myself under control. There was a dreadful night coming in Egypt. That destroying angel would go all through the land to destroy God's enemies. In preparation for this terrible event, imagine the Jewish father who takes his firstborn son by the hand and walks down to his flock. There the father picks out a wee little lamb and says, We're going to keep this lamb for 14 days. The little boy says, Why, Daddy? And the father replies, Because that little lamb is going to die for you. The lamb is not killed. If the lamb is not killed, you will be killed. Now when the 14 day came, 14th day came, the father took his firstborn and he slaughtered the lamb and preserved its blood. He put it in a basin and then he took a piece of hyssop and dipped it in the blood and struck the side posts on the top of the door. He then took his son by the hand and walked through that crimson archway into their house and shut the door and ate the roasted lamb. Can you imagine that little boy saying, Daddy, what's going to happen to that at midnight now? And the father replies, Every firstborn son who has not walked through the blood-stained doorway will die. Well, don't you think that little boy is scared now? Frightened. Oh, boy. Petrified, probably. Daddy, will I die? No, son. You will not die because that lamb has died for you, his dad replies. The death angel couldn't come, come and enter the houses. Why? Well, it wasn't the type of dwelling, was it? It wasn't, it wasn't the type of the people in the dwelling either. No one was better than the other. Well, what was it then? My friends, the difference wasn't on the inside. It was on the outside. It was the blood on the lintel that caused God to pass over. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. The blood was for God. The lamb had died in place of the firstborn. And when Jesus died, there was not only substitution, but also restitution or satisfaction. And the blood speaks of satisfaction. The constitution of God's moral government depends, depend, demands <laughs> that sin be punished. I mean, we do that now with our own government. The wages of sin is death, my friends. The soul that sins shall die. Death is the penalty for sin. God's truth had to be honored. God's holiness had to be vindicated and God's justice had to be satisfied. Under the old covenant, Israel met with God on his terms in the tabernacle. <clears throat> there were vessels of ministry in the tabernacle, the altar, the laver, the candlesticks, the incense altar, the veil, the holy place, the Ark of the Covenant, and the mercy seat. The high priest alone was allowed inside the veil only once a year, and he could only enter the Holy of Holies with a bowl of blood. Once inside, once inside the priest would take the blood and sprinkle it on the mercy seat. Now this mercy seat was a sacred place. It was where God's presence dwelt. It lived there. That's where God was. And his sprinkling of blood was a moral necessity to restrain the righteous wrath of God against sin. It took blood to propitiate, or that's appease, God's holy anger. In the Old Testament, shedding and sprinkling of blood is the shadow, but Christ is the substance. All that man had done to offend God finds an answer in the blood of Christ. The demands of, ho of a holy God are fully satisfied in Christ's death. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Isaiah 53, 10 through 11. Our guilty shame, tremendous debt, hellish thoughts, hideous past, and sinful nature are fully, totally, and absolutely satisfied by the blood of Jesus. He has made full restitution for my soul. But the cost was not cheap. Jesus bore the pain, Jesus bore the penalty, and Jesus suffered the torment, and Jesus suffered the separation. <clears throat> he was even forsaken by God the Father. He said, God, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Matthew 27, 46. <clears throat> and then he cried, it is finished. The price had been paid, the work was done, and the proof that God was satisfied is the resurrection. But the blood not only speaks God word, it also speaks man word. Hallelujah. Praise his name. 
<laughs> Christ's blood was shed then, it was sprinkled. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, Hebrews 9.22. Here's a New Testament reference to an Old Testament incident. Just like the blood was uh, applied to the doorpost, so our own hearts are sprinkled by the power of Christ's blood. Whenever there is a guilty conscience and a believing mind, the blood speaks with a tender, sweet, and inviting voice. What does the blood say? It speaks, your sins are forgiven. You are reconciled. You are accepted in the beloved. You shall never perish. There is no more sound, more piercing, more potent, and more prevailing than the voice of Christ's blood, my friends. It satisfies both, both the justice of God and the guilt of you, the man. You know, one of the most wonderful things is that the blood speaks of cleansing. Charles Spurgeon said, There is no motive for holiness so great as that which streams from the veins of Jesus. The blood is still active in cleansing from sin, for the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. 1 John 1, verse 7. The life of the blood is unabated. The power of the blood is undiminished. The blood redeems. The blood justifies. The blood sanctifies. The blood cleanses. The blood is the central thing in the Word of God. The blood is central in the mind of God, and the blood is central in the church of God. That's the body of Christ. In Genesis, how did God clothe our first fallen, shame-faced, naked parents in paradise laws? He shed blood and made coats of skin to clothe them. In Revelation, there is a great company around the throne. Who are they? These are those who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Revelation 7, verse 14. In Paradise Lost and Paradise Regained, there are garments of blood. Someone said blood was characteristic of heaven's dress. Well, what is heaven's dress code? Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. The great truth taught here is that we enter heaven in the garments of our substitute, clad in the righteousness of Christ. Hallelujah. Now, this ought to make your heart leap. It ought to make your eyes shoot out with tears of joy. We <laughs> read 41 times in the Old Testament that the lamb used in the Levitical sacrifices was to be without blemish. In the New Testament, we read of our lamb. In him was no sin. In first, that's 1 first John chapter 3, verse 5. Who did no sin, 1 Peter 2.22, and who knew no sin, 2 Corinthians 5.21. No wonder we find such power in the sinless, spotless Lamb who washed us from our sins in his own blood. Revelation 1, verse 5. Listen, if the blood of bulls and goats sanctified the unclean under the old covenant, how much more shall the blood of Christ purge your conscience from dead works to serving the living God? Hebrews 9, verse 14. The blood speaks of peace having made peace through the blood of his cross. Colossians 1, chapter, tw chapter 1, verse 20. <clears throat> Christ's blood is peacekeeping blood as opposed to enmity arousing blood. It speaks better things than that of Abel. Abel's blood for vengeance pleaded to the skies, but the blood of Jesus Christ for my pardon cries. Abel's plea prevailed. Cain was punished, but Christ's blood pleads for mercy. The blood has always been precious been. Tis precious now to me, though through it alone my soul has rest from fear and doubt set free. Charles Spurgeon said the wounds of Jesus have become doors of grace through which divine love comes forth to the vilest of the vile. Listen, my friends, does the blood of Christ speak peace to your heart? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Do you hear the voice of the blood? There is no mercy to be vented without blood. No righteousness to be vindicated without blood and no peace to be purchased without blood. And finally, finally, the blood speaks of victory. Have you ever noticed that all the hymns about the blood are songs of victory? The blood also provides an inexhaustible subject for eternal praise in the heavens. And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. Revelation 5.9 the blood is victory over Satan. The enemy of our souls is called adversary, angel of light, father of lies, accuser of the brethren. In Revelation 12, it tells us they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. Revelation 12, verse 11. <clears throat> Throughout history, Satan has sought to cast doubt upon the character of God. And back in Eden, he questioned Eve. Hath God said? In the wilderness temptation, the slanderer questioned Christ. If thou be the son of God... 
Thank God, while Satan's not yet silenced, we have victory over all doubt and hard thoughts toward God. Because why? Because the prince of this world has been judged. Victory over the world, victory over death, victory over hell, victory over sin. Sing, O ye sinners bought with blood, hail the great three in one. Tell how secure the covenant stood, ere time its race begun. Ne'er had you felt the guilt of sin, nor sweets of pardoning love, unless your worthless names had been enrolled to life above. Oh, what a sweet exalted song shall render the vaulted skies, when shouting grace and blood-washed throngs shall see the top stone rise. Yes, my friends, the blood speaks. Boy, does it speak. It speaks to God. It speaks to the guilty conscience of man. It speaks to your heart. This is not a superstition. It's not a mere theory or philosophical escape. It's not a mystical daydream. This is the voice of the blood, the blood of Christ, and it speaks better things, better, better, better things than that of Abel. So I ask you again, do you hear the voice of the blood? We will return after this brief intermission. <laughs> 